Hi, I'm Erica Mabian. I am the iSPARK STEM coordinator for Kansas City Public Schools, and welcome to KCPS Homeroom. Today we're going to talk about computer programming, more specifically, conditional programming. You will find computer programming similar to writing a story, and we're going to talk about all of those types of things and get in depth on how to do programming using our block programming. So let's get started. The first thing you're going to do is log into scratch.mit.edu backslash name. This particular program is going to be one that you can create a fun and creative way to animate your name. Your to-do list for today is going to include choosing a letter, making it change colors, add sound, and a backdrop. You're going to be able to do that for each individual letter of your name. All right, so let's see. The purpose of what we're going to do is to really focus on those if-then statements. If this happens, then it will cause a chain reaction to something else happening or the other thing will occur. So one of the things that you're going to be able to do is play sound when it is clicked, when your letter is clicked, change colors when your letter is clicked, and spin and grow your letter when you click it. All right, so here's the first example. We've chosen the letter Q. For this particular program, we started with the event block. The event block tells us when this sprite is clicked, then it's going to play the sound meow, like a cat. It's going to continue to play meow until it's done for the duration of time that the program is coordinated. So you want to click your event block and choose your sound block. If you'd like to change the sound and you don't prefer a meow, if you click the downspout arrow, there are other options, or you can record your own sound. Okay, so we just finished programming the first letter that we are going to use. Letter Q, we've made that half sound. Let's move on to the next letter. Our next letter is going to be a K. For this particular one, we use when the sprite is clicked, we're going to be able to change the color and the effect by 25. 25 is going to be our variable. The 25, you can change that to whatever number you'd like. Play around with it and decide on how you want to change the number or what you want the number to be. And you can also choose the downspout um, arrow here in order to have a different option. So first, choose your event block when the sprite is clicked. Then you choose your looks block, change the color by the effect. And the effect is going to be the type of color or the range of the color that you're wanting. Let's move on to the next letter. All right, for the letter T, we are going to make this one spin. And we're starting with our event block when the sprite is clicked. Then we move on to, we want this one to repeat. It's going to have a loop. So we have our repeater block and we have this for set for 15. So it's going to make 15 consecutive spins before it stops. And within that program, it's going to change its size by 10. Again, there's that 10 is a variable. So you could change that number. So the first part of our program is going to be when the sprite is clicked, Repeat 15 times, change the size by 10. And that's going to go for a consecutive 15. Now let's move on to our second part of that program. Repeat by 15 again. So those are going to match. So they're going to stop at the same time. This time we're going to change our size by a negative 10. So that means our size is going to get smaller. So by looking at this program, I noticed that if we click the sprite, which is the letter T, our size is going to get larger by 10 and get smaller by 10 for a 15 count duration. So both of those are going to match. So let's move on to the next letter. All right, our next letter is letter I. This one, we are going to make the sprite grow. So let's see, when the sprite is clicked, that's our event block, our control block is going to be repeat 10 times. That is within our loop. And our next one is going to be turn 15 degrees. Our sensing block is telling us to turn 15 degrees. So wait one second. 
So all of those together, that lets me know that when I click the sprite, which is our letter I, it's going to repeat 10 times. Our loop is going to be turn 15 degrees, wait one second, turn 15 degrees again, wait one second. And it's going to continue that path for a consecutive 10 times. All right, so I want you guys to practice these if-then statements. Pick out your letters and figure out what type of programs that you could make. Tweet out your programs and make sure you tag us at KC Public Schools and use our hashtag KCPPublicSchools at homeroom. All right, let's check out another program. This particular one is going to show us about those if-then statements. If you take a look at the program that I've created, I have a backdrop here, and the backdrop matches the scenery and the actions that are going on in the program. The backdrop that I've chosen is a sea, they're underwater, and appropriately, I've chosen a diver and a shark. And a couple of things also that we have here is the man is talking. So those are all things that I programmed within this particular pattern. So let's take a look at our program. So there's a lot of things going on in our program. When I look at the back, the backdrop, the stage is listed on the right side of the screen. You're able to change that and modify that by choosing this choose backdrop icon and then you're able to go in and change the backdrop or add some color or even upload a backdrop that of your choosing. For our characters or our sprites, our sprites are listed here in this control box. So in the back of our stage, we're having a shark and it's already pre-animated and we also have a diver and he is also has some animation also. So let's take a look at the program that I gave for the diver. I know that this program is for the diver because it has the sprite name diver right in our control box. So I know that that's the one that I'm programming. If I select the shark, it will highlight and I can change it. Then I notice that our sprite is listed there and it says shark and then the program that is used for the shark is listed. So let's just start with the shark. So for the shark, I programmed it with starting with our event block when the green flag is clicked. Then I told the program to switch to the underwater. I wanted to make sure that my backdrop was set for underwater because I thought that was the most appropriate way to create our storyline. Next, forever, that means that my loop is not going to stop. But what do I want my loop to do? So within my loop, I programmed it to wait just a little bit of time, so I did 0.1 seconds. Move 10 steps. So that shark is gonna move 10 steps, stop and wait for 0.1 second. Then he's gonna change costumes. That means that he's gonna switch colors or switch directions if he bounces to the edge. And that will ensure that my shark stays in my scenery the whole time. So let's take a look at our shark. When he bounces to the edge, he goes right back looking for that diver. And he's gonna bounce to the other edge and he's gonna go right back looking for that diver. His actions and his loop, remember we programmed that to forever. So let's take a look at the diver blocks that we programmed. All right, so our program started with when we click the green flag and then our costume is going to be our diver so we're able to also change that so I'm going to click that down arrow so you can see exactly what our options are so I can have it be diver 1 or diver 2 so I'm going to keep my diver 1 because that's where we were I have a hide and a show and it's kind of hidden in our program so we want to show diver 1 and then here's that loop again so let's see what our conditions are for our loop so our loop is going to say repeat forever. We're going to have a continuous motion of that diver. He's going to wait 0.01 seconds and then move 10 steps. So he's going to fly a little bit through the water. And when he touches that edge, he's going to bounce back also. But then there's a little caveat I added to make this program a little bit more interesting. I told it if you touch the shark, because we know what happens when the shark gets you. 
the shark is going to get him. And when it does, I program it to say, ah! So he's going to say, ah, for one second. So let's take a look at our program and see if he's getting close. If you watch that diver, he's going to keep swimming. That shark's going to keep swimming. And when they collide, just like that, he's going to say, ah, and he will disappear. So let's continue on with our program and take a look at what else is going to happen. So here's that loop again. I know it's in the loop because it's in those large brackets. And that's my if-then statement. He says, ah, broadcast the message, say it for this long, and then he waits. He's going to disappear, so we have that hide. Wait three seconds, come back in a random position, and show himself. So here we are down to the last thing. So after he reappears, he gets to switch to a new diver or the next costume. So if we take a look at that program, we can see that there are a lot of different options for our conditional statement and what we can program our shark and our diver to do. So this is going to be our conditional statements for if then. If the shark runs into the diver, then he's going to say ah, ah, and then he's going to disappear and then reappear as it's programmed. So I really want you to practice out those if then statements and see how creative you could get. You could have your program be a soccer game and when that player runs up to that ball, he kicks it. So if the player runs up to the ball, then the ball will roll because the player has kicked it. There are a lot of variations to your if then statement that you could create just by writing down your program, creating your storyline, deciding on your backdrop and your characters that are going to be involved. So let me show you where you can find all of your programs that you're wanting to use, all of your blocks. The first set of blocks are our motion blocks. They let our characters move in all different types of directions. They keep our characters in motion and they get to have the position that we program it. The variables which are all the circle with the numbers inside. We're able to change those. If we click inside that number, we are able to change that variable and make it be whatever we like. There's no wrong or right within your program. Just plug them in, start small, check it out, click the green flag and see how you like it, and then you can continue on with the next program. So these are our motion blocks. They help our sprites or our characters have motion. Then we have our looks blocks. They're purple. A lot of the looks blocks allow our characters to talk. So particular this one, you can have it say hello, but you can change that. If you click inside the box, you can type in the words that you would like for it to say, or if you're so inclined, you could record your own voice and have it in there. You can decide how long you want them to talk by changing the variable of the time in the, in the program. And then down below, there are a lot of other different options. So I suggest playing around with it, plug in some blocks and see what you come up with. Our sound blocks, they're really fun. They're programmed with lots of sounds. You can include some that are already listed or record your own. Your event blocks begin your program. If you notice my event block in my program was right at the top. And the one that I chose was click the green flag and that will initiate my program. I can just go over to the green flag on the right and get it started. Or if I want to reset my program, I'm clicking the red stop sign. So the event blocks start your program. So you have a lot of different ways. You can do the space bar or you could click the sprite or you have a lot of other different things that connect to your program and how you want your program to do and whether the conditions are that you want your program to start. Underneath those event blocks are our control blocks. Our control blocks help us determine how we want things to go. That's your waits, those are your loops, your forever and repeats, your if then conditional statements are in here. So like this particular one, if I do something then. So the something is another block that we have to add. And that leads us to our sensing blocks. 
Our sensing blocks are kind of like when you play tag and you notice that someone touched you and you're like, oh, I'm out. Your sensing blocks are like that and you're able to have different control over what you want it to do. So here are our sensing blocks. We just pop those in our control blocks based on what you would like for it to do. You could change the color. You could have it touch different things depending on your program and how you want it to do. You can even have it ask questions. You could have your characters have a conversation within your program by having them use the sensing blocks because that will tell your program when this person talks, then the other person can talk. So the last couple of ones that we have are our variables. Our variables help us an opportunity to activate our math because as you can see here they have a greater than less than some equals and some other equations so you get to decide on how you want to use that and how that is applicable to your program and last are our variable blocks our variable blocks you can make one you can have a list of them or choose some from other programs that you find are useful and borrow those for your programs so this has concluded our section on conditional programming. Please tweet out your programs and make sure you tag KC Public Schools and hashtag KCPS Homeroom. Have fun coding in Scratch. And this is Erica Mabian. I am the iSpark STEM co coordinator for Kansas City Public Schools. Have fun coding. <laughs>Good afternoon. My name is Chef Tom. I'm a culinary instructor here at Manual Career and Training Center at 1215 Truman Road. I'm in the Kansas City, Missouri School District and today we're going to work through a very simple chicken dinner. We're going to go ahead and marinate this fresh, fresh chicken in some olive oil, lemon, garlic, salt, pepper, and rosemary. And to do that, we're gonna to have to go ahead by filleting this chicken up a little bit. So I'm gonna start with that. And go ahead and get our gloves on. One really, really important thing here is sanitation. And that's why you're gonna see that we have a separate cutting board for the chicken. Physical separation is very, very important at every turn. First thing we're gonna do is give our knife a good edge because a dull knife is much more dangerous than a sharp knife. We're gonna make sure that we have total separation on these boards. We're gonna take our chicken and clean it up a little. 
And then we're going to give it a slice lengthways because on the broiler, a thicker piece of chicken is not going to cook as well as a thinner piece of chicken. Okay? So there we have some beautiful fillets that we're going to use. At this point, we're going to go ahead and change our gloves. And we're going to make a very quick marinade. Our marinade is going to consist of olive oil, fresh lemon, We're going to go ahead and we're going to give our rosemary a, a fresh little chop here before it goes in the bowl. That's just to start to get those flavors out and incorporated. We're going to grab a little salt, pepper, and we're going to grab a spoon for some garlic. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to mix that up quick. As soon as that's mixed up, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our chicken breasts and we're going to go ahead and we're going to put them right in here. We're going to turn them so that we get them completely covered in this delicious rosemary and garlic and salt and pepper. Nice lemon in there. And we're going to set this off to the side. We're going to go ahead and we're going to get rid of these gloves because they've just touched chicken. And we're going to take one second and we're going to get rid of this board and plate and knife that our chicken were on. Now then, moving forward, we're going to go ahead and get our potatoes ready. Our potatoes are going to be a Red Bliss mashed potato. Super easy. We're just going to take these potatoes and cut them in half. And you might ask why I don't have my gloves on right now. Right now, I'm working with pre-cooked food. These foods are going to be cooked to up and above 165 degrees. So the fact that I'm not wearing gloves is not a, is not a part of this. It does not matter at this point. We're going to take these perfect little potatoes and we're going to get them into our water. But you really need your water to be at a full boil when these potatoes go in because it's going to take 10 to 15 minutes for these potatoes to cook. Because you have to remember when these potatoes are done, they're going to be a garlic smashed potato. They're not going to be a really finely mashed potato. They're going to be a little chunky. But the fact of the matter is they have to be completely cooked. These potatoes will typically take about 10 minutes to cook. So at this point, that leaves us our asparagus to get ready. And asparagus is a pretty tender vegetable. We have to be a little bit careful with it, but it is going on the broiler today. So we're gonna go ahead and cut off these woody ends because these ends of the asparagus, they're a little bit chewy and just not delicious. Once we have our asparagus in our little pot, we're gonna grab our olive oil, drizzle them down. And we want that oil on that asparagus so that when it goes to the broiler, we get a really nice caramelization. So at this point, our potatoes are boiling, our asparagus is ready to go, and our chicken is marinating. So we're going to give that chicken just another minute or two, and then we'll head to the broiler. So after washing our hands again, we're going to go ahead and don some fresh gloves, and we're going to get ready to cook some chicken. Now, me personally, when I'm cooking chicken on the broiler, I like to have crisscross marks on that chicken. And so one of the things we, we do is when it's about halfway done on the first round, we'll go ahead and we'll turn it 90 degrees. Now this chicken looks beautiful. We're gonna go ahead and give this chicken a little shot of salt and pepper right away.
Beautiful. Now, the thing is, you don't want this chicken to get away with, from you. With this much fire going on, it'll be real easy for this chicken to get away. So, we're gonna very quickly take and make that 90 degree turn on each of these chicken breasts. And now we're gonna give this chicken about 45 seconds to a minute to go ahead and cook. And while that's happening, we're gonna run over and grab our asparagus. And we're gonna get it ready to go on this broiler at the same time as the chicken is on. And remember, we put a little bit of olive oil on here. Once we have our asparagus on, then we'll go ahead and we'll salt and pepper it. So now these chicken breasts should have a good marking. Yeah, that's looking beautiful. That's what we want every time. Now we're gonna go ahead with the spatula. And we wanna make sure that when we put this asparagus on, we are crossways to the grill. Because if we're not, there's a good chance that we're gonna lose some of that asparagus into the grill. We're gonna go ahead with our salt and pepper just as before. Never, never be afraid to season your vegetables. Some vegetables are delicious, but they're so much better with a little bit of seasoning. The other important thing is that this asparagus literally only takes about two minutes, okay? We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna give it a turn. And try and not let any of it get away. I'm gonna get her all back together here. And in about one minute's time, that asparagus is gonna be done. And this whole time we're going ahead and we're just letting that chicken cook because that chicken's got to cook all the way to 165 degrees. If you're letting chicken off the grill before then, it's, you've got a really good chance of hitting some salmonella. We're going to give our chicken one more turn this way. Another 90 degrees here. And now you start to see this asparagus is starting to get a really beautiful deep green color. We're going to leave it for about another 30 seconds. If you look, you can start to see that oil burning up a little bit. Very, very nice. A lot of flavor there. This is a little bit of an older broiler, so there's a lot of char flavor to it. Give it about 10 quick seconds and we're going to go ahead and get that asparagus off of there. You know, we may be doing better with our tongs on this. There we go. So I'm gonna run over and grab our thermometers so that we can start to check this chicken because we should be getting very close. When you check the temperature of any meat on your broiler, the best way to do that is to just take that whole piece right off and take your thermometer right into the thickest part. You can see we're up to 161, 170. That chicken is done. That is what you want. So let's grab another pan and we'll take our chicken off. Looks delicious. This is really some of my favorite chicken in the world. Then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna shut off our broiler right now because we don't need any added heat into the kitchen. So at this point with our chicken and our asparagus done, we're gonna get ready to drain these potatoes and we're gonna smash them. We're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of garlic and butter and salt and pepper and we're gonna hit them with our masher. Super easy, nothing intimidating about it. But you're gonna come out with something that people think you are a magician. Really a cool thing. One of the first things we're going to do, though, is we're going to go ahead and we're going to chop up a little bit of parsley for these potatoes. And one other thing that we have to do yet is we have to go ahead and cut up our lemon for our garnish on our chicken. Because every single thing you do should have a garnish. 
you know, it's, it's important that you make your food as presentable as possible. Here we've gone ahead and we've done up our parsley. We're going to give our knife a quick little wipe. Then we're going to get this here lemon. We're just going to do a couple of real nice thin slices. Okay. We're going to put all this in our garbage bowl over here. We're going to take and we're going to make a little slit down at the bottom. We're going to go ahead and we're going to twist that like that. And now we're going to go ahead and drain these potatoes. Now you see me with a towel on this handle. Do not for one minute think that these pans do not get roasting hot when you're working with them. They do. So always keep yourself a good dry towel in the kitchen with you. Here we've got our potatoes ready to go. We're going to go ahead, we're going to throw in a little fresh parsley. We'll grab us a spoon, throw in some nice butter. Got to have a little salt and pepper. And then finally, we got to have some garlic. We're going to take our potato masher. Remember what I said about that handle? Still very hot. We're going to take our masher and we're just going to smash these potatoes. And as we're going through it, you just want to knock them off the blade of the smasher and keep on going. And you can see that these are coming out just beautiful. This is exactly what you want. And that's all the smashing you want. You don't have to mash them like a fine mashed potato. We just have to give them a little smashing. And guess what? It's time to go ahead and plate up this delicious meal. We're going to start with our smashed potatoes. Okay, we're going to throw a little tiny bit of that fresh parsley right up on top of there. Make it look beautiful. Then we're going to grab our asparagus. And we're going to find some pieces that are remotely the same size. We're just going to put that up at the top here. And then we're going to find our chicken. We're going to lay that right in there like that. And then we're going to take our garnish, put that right on there with some fresh parsley. And we'll throw on a little bit of fresh rosemary. And that is your delicious supper. I chose manual because it's challenging and fun and it can help me with college. I chose manual because I wanted to get a jump start in my career with culinary arts. I chose manual to acquire skills I'd use in real life. I chose manual because I want to be an ER doctor and being an EMT is my first step. Kickstart your future today at Manual Career and Technical Center. Manual is open for all 11th and 12th grade students in both Kansas and Missouri. Learn more today at enrollkc.org slash manual or call 816-418-5200. I love Southeast because of the culture, the bank program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academic, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. Southeast. We stand shoulder to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today.
Welcome back to PE with Coach K. Today we are live in my gym at Foreign Language Academy. So for today's segment, we are going to dive deep into our PE, physical education, knowledge and terms. One of the fundamental movements that we're gonna focus on today is locomotor movements. What are locomotor movements? Locomotor movements are movements where you travel from one place to another. So for our activities today, you are going to need three mats. You can have, I have mats, locomotor mats, or you can use three pieces of paper. And you can find three pieces of paper at home. I have construction paper, or you can just use regular white paper. You wanna spread them out, just like, I, just like how I have down here. You wanna make sure that they have some space in between each paper. So the three locomotive movements that we're gonna focus on today are jumping, we're gonna focus on running, and we're gonna focus on walking. So when you think of traveling from one place to another, when you think about running, you can visualize a basketball game where you have players running from one end of the basketball court to the other end, meaning they are traveling from one place to another. When you look at jumping, I think about Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, where he goes from the ground to the, up to the, by the net when he dunks. He's jumping from one and traveling to another place which is up towards where the net is. And walking, we walk from class to class if we were in school, or we'll walk in the mall, we'll take a walk on a trail, but we're traveling from one place to another. So we're gonna focus on those three locomotor movements. Remember, locomotor movements is where you travel from one place to another. So when we do jumping, Actually, we're gonna start with running. That way we can kind of warm up our bodies a little bit. So the first activity that we're gonna do, I'm gonna demonstrate three of them and then we're gonna do it together. So when we do running, you are gonna do a figure eight. I'm just gonna walk through it, but we're actually gonna be running through it. So you're, you're going through the paper, out, through, and out. So the goal is to not touch the paper on the floor at all. So I'm gonna run, let me demonstrate, you're gonna run through, you're doing like a figure eight, turn back around and you do it again. Now, we're gonna do 30 seconds of this running figure eight through our papers. So when you run through one, through two, I want you to touch the floor or whatever is nearby and then you'll turn around and go back and touch the floor. So we're gonna see how many times can you go down and back in 30 seconds, that's our running portion. Going into jumping, when we jump, there's two different ways you can jump. We're gonna make sure it's still, the goal is to not touch the papers on the floor. So when you jump, you can jump going forward, make sure you are jumping in that open spot between the two pieces of paper. Turn back around, or you can jump sideways, and turn back around. Now you're gonna see how many times you can do it down and back in 30 seconds. And our last one, which will give us a nice little cool down, is just walking. You can kind of think of it as you're doing musical chairs where you're just walking around the chairs. You're gonna see how many full circles can you make in 30 minutes. That will let our heart rate go down. We will use that as our cool down as we end our segment for today. So let's go ahead and get started. If you need to pause to put your paper down on the floor, line it up, make sure you have enough space so you're not running into anything or tripping over anything. So we're gonna start with our running portion. 30 seconds. How many times can you run down and back doing your figure eight. We're gonna start in three, two, one. Let's go. Make sure you touch the floor and go back. Keep going. Breathe. Come on, we almost there. 10 more seconds. Five, four, Three, two, 
one. So I hope you counted while you were running back and forth. I forgot to count. But I want you to remember your number, write it down, put it in your phone, put it in your notes, wherever you place any information at, remember it. And that way to improve, you can challenge yourself to do it another day. Maybe you can do it for a longer period of time and to challenge yourself to see if you can get higher than what you did today. So we're gonna take a breath before we go into our jumps, because today we're focusing on running, jumping and walking. We did running, one of the locomotive movements. Now we're going to jump. We're gonna see how many times we can go down and back in 30 seconds. So catch your breath. We got five seconds, four, three, two, one. And then turn back around and do it again. Try not to touch the papers on the floor. We got 10 more seconds. Be careful, stay light on your feet. Five seconds, three, two, one. Okay, remember that number? Write it down somewhere. How many times were you able to go back and forth during your jumping? Challenge yourself on another day to see if you can get a higher number or go for a longer period of time. So once again, let's catch our breath. Breathe in through your nose and then out through your mouth as we go to our third segment, which is walking. This is our cool down. Remember, we're walking around in circles. How many full circles can we do in 30 seconds? Ready? Five, four, three, two, and let's go. So breathe, you can use this time, catch your breath. If you wanna speed walk, if you still have some energy, you can. But let this be your cool down. How many complete circles can you make? 30 seconds, we only have about 15 seconds left. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And you can also write that number down. How many did you, how many were you able to complete? Challenge yourself to get a higher number or walk for a long period of time. So as we bring this to an end, what I want you to do at home is I want you to choose one of the three locomotor movements we did today. And what were those? Running, jumping, and walking. You're gonna choose one of those and you're gonna use it you can do it with a friend, you can do it by yourself, but I want you to pick one of those and I want you to perform it for two minutes. You can do exactly what we did today, or instead of running through pieces of paper, you can run outside or maybe jog outside for two minutes, or maybe run around your house for two minutes. Um, instead of walking around a circle, maybe you can walk through your house or walk a long distance from your house to the store, whatever you can do. And instead of jumping through the pieces of paper, maybe you have a rope at home and you can jump rope for two minutes. But I want you to challenge yourself to choose one of the locomotive movements to do for two minutes. Now you can up it three minutes another day, go maybe three minutes and 30 seconds, whatever you do to help improve your ability in doing locomotive movements. So as a review, before we end and we leave, we wanna make sure that we remember what we learned during this segment. One of the fundamental movements that we went over today is locomotor movements, where you are traveling from one place to another. Three of those locomotor movements that we covered are jumping, walking, and running, because we are traveling from one place to another. So I just wanna remind you to challenge yourself at home with a friend, maybe make it a competition. That way you can improve your skills and movement in locomotor movements. And I hope to see you next week.
desire to create lives within each of us. From Grammy-winning producers and musicians, to NBA stars, to Navy admirals and Medal of Honor recipients, to internationally renowned artists and beloved local muralists, Paseo graduates have been creating their own success, their own history, their own legacy since 1926. Now it's your time. Create your future at Paseo Academy of Fine and Performing Arts. Learn more at enrollkc.org slash Paseo. I love Southeast because of the culture, the bank program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academic, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. Southeast. We stand shoulder to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today. Hello everyone, this is Amber Underwood and I'm here representing the Kansas City Public School District and I'm so excited to be here. And I'm also representing my school, Central Middle School Warhawk. Ah <laughs> so a little bit about myself. I have been in the district for nine years and I love it. I uh, was appointed to start both the middle schools at Central Middle School and Northeast Middle School starting their band programs and orchestra programs. And so now I'm here to talk to you guys about music, beginning band, um, how to play an instrument, how to get a great sound on your instrument. And so I wanted to focus on my personal favorite instrument, the flute. So a little bit about my background and my playing is that I started playing the flute in the fifth grade. and. I wouldn't say it was my first love, but it took some work and then it became my love. Um, I got my master's, I have two master's actually, um, from the University of Missouri, Kansas City and Pittsburgh State University, all in music because this is always what I wanted to do. So, and I'm here with you guys ex showing you and expressing my passion through music and teaching. So, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to do today. So, I have three students that's going to demonstrate the beginner level, the intermediate level, and the advanced level. So today, um, Cara Bernardino, she is my elementary beginner level student, and she is from. Um, North Davies K through 12 from Jamison, Missouri. And she's gonna show us how to care and, and maintenance for our instrument, as well as getting an, a nice sound on the head joint. And then she puts her instruments together and we go over the different parts of the instrument. And then she's gonna show you how to play a scale. These are all the different things that you're gonna learn in beginning band. So are you guys ready? Everybody, I want to introduce to you Cara Bernardino. Hello everyone, we are here today to talk about how to play an instrument and today we're going to be focusing on the flute. What a great instrument. So the flute is part of the woodwind family and we're going to start with each level. The first level we're going to start with is the elementary level. So when you join band, um, we you are in beginning band and so what are the things that you learn in beginning band? Well, let me tell you, we're going to learn about how to care for our instrument, our maintenance, we're going to learn how to put together our instrument, and we're going to learn how to get a sound. So I have one of my students here, Kara, is going to show us a few things on what she has learned doing her beginning band classes. So let's start with just how to care for the instrument. So the first thing that we're going to learn is how to care for our instrument. <laughs> So we're gonna take the flute right here. As you can see, it's all put together. What you never want to do is put this instrument in water. That is very, very bad, okay? 
One thing why we don't put it in water, because if you can see here, there are some pads under these keys. And so we do not want to get these pads wet, all right? Or it'll be a very expensive uh, repair bill. So you don't want to do that. Um, the only thing, this is actually um, an instrument that is very low in maintenance. So the only thing that you need is just a polishing cloth and, um, and a um, cloth to go inside to clean out that nasty spit that you get in there. So once that's done, um, we're gonna learn how to put the instrument together. So I'm actually gonna take your instrument apart. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so here we have the head joint. Right here we have the head joint of the flute. So you have the tip, you have the lip plate, and you have the embouchure hole. Can you guys say embouchure? It's a really fancy word that we like to say. And, and so this is how you form the lips on the lip plate, and we call it the embouchure. All right, so this is very important piece. So I'm gonna let you hold that. Here you have the body of the instrument, the main part of the instrument, the body of the instrument, and then you have the foot joint. So it's three pieces of the flute. So I'm gonna have Kara put together her instrument and one of the things that she's going to pay real close attention to is that every time we put a piece together, we're making sure that we're holding it by the neck of the instrument and we're using a twisting motion to put our flute together. So Kara, can you show us how to do that? As you can see, she is twisting the head joint onto the body. Excellent. I guess you need the foot joint, right? <laughs> All right, and so the next thing that Cara will need to do is make sure that her flute is in aligned. And some things I like to do is look down the flute. If you can look down the flute from the, yep. And she's making sure that all the keys are in line with the embouchure hole, okay? So let's make sure that we have all of those in place and then we're ready to play. So that is how you put your flute together. All right, so as a beginner, you necessarily probably do not want to try playing the entire flute all at once. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask Cara, Cara, can you take off your head joint for me, please? All right, you can hand me the rest of the body. Thank you. All right, so how do we make a sound on a flute? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our finger and we're going to take, find the curvature of your lower lip and we're going to put the lip plate right under the lower lip. Can you show us? Excellent. So what she did was she took she took the embouchure hole and she rolled it down right under her lip. All right. And I always like to say Winnie the Pooh. You know that kind of gives us a nice sound. So Cara, can you demonstrate on how we get a sound on just the head joint? So you get it. it it's not a best sound but it's a sound and so if you can get that sound you are already on your way to the best sound possible so let's try that again so this time i'm gonna have car relax her body and relax her shoulders and she's gonna take a nice deep breath on the letter o so we're gonna go let our all of our air out and go <sighs> all right let's give it a try wow so much better, right? It's so much better because she got a very um, deep, she had a nice deep breath. So she relaxed her body, she kept her shoulders down, and then she said in her head, Winnie the Pooh, right? Okay, so now we're gonna take the rest of the instrument and she's gonna twist that head joint back on. And if you notice, she's keeping her hands right at the neck of the instrument. She's not holding onto any of the keys to mess up those mechanisms because that right there would be an expensive repair bill to the repair shop and we don't want that. All right, are you all good? All right. Nope. No, not yet. So she's just getting it adjusted and aligned. All right, so you can play any note. So now that she has the whole entire flute together, let's see what it sounds like with just any note. You can just play any note. Keep your chin up. Beautiful. So that's one of the first notes that you would probably learn in beginning band. Um, I think she played a B flat. So um, 
one of those notes that everybody learns how to play first so and she got a nice great sound so by the time you finish probably with um your first semester of band you should be able to do a b flat major scale so that what a scale is that is a um notes that are made up of eight different notes and it's consecutive um going ascending and descending of a scale so Kara is going to demonstrate how to play B flat major scale. So these are all the different things that you would learn in beginning band. So here we go, let's give it a try. Good, come on down, let's go down the scale. Starting from B. Starting from B flat, high B flat. Good job. All right, so by the time your son or daughter is done with beginning band, my goodness, look what, how far they have came. So thank you so much, Cara. You did a wonderful job and keep up the good work. The desire to create lives within each of us. From Grammy-winning producers and musicians, to NBA stars, to Navy admirals and Medal of Honor recipients, to internationally renowned artists and beloved local muralists, Paseo graduates have been creating their own success, their own history, their own legacy since 1920.